So, 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 we are doing Elysian card breakdowns. Elysian is uh, the prime time faction, and uh, it's a color of big, mid-range, scary threats, lots of uh, fun and interactive card advantage cards. I tend to really just overwhelm your opponent with a lot of sheer force, and uh, it's, it's, it's fun stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about these cards, and uh, we're going to hopefully finish off the card breakdowns before set two launches. Uh, so yeah, we've got Call the Ancients is our first one. Put four 6-6 six, six Titans with Aegis and Endurance into your deck. That is an extreme amount of power for one power, and it's one of those two cards that clearly sort of demonstrates that you can do something awesome, but uh, there is a drawback, and it's also like a, a good sort of a teacher of Eternal in that this card is actually quite bad. Like, you, there are not that many decks that it goes into. Um, the decks that it does go into, it's actually quite strong because obviously those 6-6 six, six Titans are very, very scary. And uh, as a quick note, those 6-6 six, six Titans do in fact cost 2 power. So uh, they are crazy hard to kill. They defend very well. They're bigger than Sandstorm Titans. And uh, they're just kind of just raucous and nuts. I love the art on this card. This card is so pretty. Um, this card is really, really good in draft because... Like, putting four titans into a 45-card deck means that you're actually really likely to draw a titan. And a titan is a card that you really, really want in a draft deck. Uh, in Ranked, it is mostly about trying to find the titan and play the titan. There aren't that many good ways to do that. Uh, Rise to the Challenge is one of them. It's not typically worth it, but it's occasionally worth it to do it that way. Celestial Omen is almost certainly not worth it to do it that way. Just drawing through a bunch of your deck, however, can be a really powerful way to set up these titans and sort of give them to your uh, deck. The thing about this card is that it is always card disadvantage. It does not draw you any cards. It does not in any way increase the amount of cards that you are playing. In fact, it removes a card from your hand in order to put a bunch of cards in your deck. And having more cards in your deck is not actually a good thing. It just makes it hard to draw all of your other good stuff. So Call the Ancients can be pretty underwhelming in ranked, but there are some cool decks that you can build around it where you basically just abuse the Titans as much as possible. And if you're a fan of rolling the dice, uh, Call the Ancients 1 into Titan 2 is pretty much just the best curve. So, uh, yeah. Oh, the card's awesome in premium, huh? That's good to know. I think I might actually have enough to craft it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a super pretty premium. I should definitely craft one when I get the chance. I've already got four copies, however, so uh, we're not in any hurry. Accelerated Evolution. So this is a 2-2 two, two, or a 2-cost Echo that gives a unit plus 1, plus 1 in your choice of flying or endurance. In draft, this card is absolutely insane. It's just a pure bomb. Uh, being able to give two different units huge buffs as well as the flying ability or the endurance ability means that you can crack yourself out of a lot of really scary situations. You can pressure for damage in places that you would not otherwise be able to do. And uh, yeah, the other thing is that uh, it is just, yeah, it's it's super rad for a lot of different reasons. Um, I like this card almost better than Infinite Hourglass for the job that it does, which is to break permafrosts in Ranked. Um, I often end up using Infinite Hourglass instead just because I kind of forget this card exists. But it is pretty good at its job in Ranked of getting rid of any sort of stun effect and making your units able to block in ways that are really beneficial to you. It is obviously not a terribly good rate, and that rate means that it's not great in uh, the more focused sets, or in other, in other words, it's not as good in Ranked just because this card does not uh, improve your board state tremendously against a lot of hard removal, and a lot of times it doesn't get your units to be big enough to actually like get over whatever threat it is that they're going to deal with. So Vanquish, Annihilate, Death Strike all make Accelerate Evolution a little bit worse. In a world where those aren't being played and you're more dealing with like torches and other big units, Accelerated Evolution is a decent pick and uh, probably could be played more in Ranked. In draft, pick this card first if you can. It's crazy. Stormlinks, 2-3 Ambush. This card is a removal spell that is also a pretty good unit. 
uh, whether you play it as a removal spell or a unit is pretty questionable. So as a result, your deck has to have a certain kind of tempo bent in order to want to play it. But it is very, very good at eating 2-2s two and making Rakano decks very sad. Stormlinks' health means that it can still be Torch, so it's not always the perfect answer to a Rakano deck, but it's often a very good one, and it's usually good to have a bunch of these guys in your deck if you're playing a, an Elysian deck that wants to get to the late game and knows that there's a lot of aggro out there. Stormlink is also a card that benefits really well from being buffed by anything. Twinning Ritual is the card to its right. That card is actually okay on Stormlinks. Uh, basically anything that like gives it a bunch of war cries and stuff makes it a really fun option for a removal spell because it can pick up some targets that you really wouldn't expect it to, and it'll live through the exchange, which means that it's a two-for-one advantage. As a result, the card is bonkers in draft. Uh, the threat of this card alone is a reason to just kind of leave your blue and yellow open. Uh, a lot of people won't attack into that, and they're generally right not to do so, uh, because obviously there's also Lightning Strike at two, so it's a it's a really scary threat, and it's a pretty good card for answering those Lathrai Rangers in a way that's really definitive and uh, solid for draft. In ranked, this card doesn't see enough play, but it is a correct choice in many ranked decks if you're trying to get that early tempo into your mid-range deck. Twinning Ritual. Draw a copy of a unit in your hand. The copy gets plus one, plus one. Yeah, Obelisk. Ch Chalice also works very well with Stormlinks. Uh, Twinning Ritual is really, really solid for um, a lot of things. Let's see here. So the main thing about it is that sometimes you draw Twinning Ritual when you want to draw a unit, as opposed to uh, just getting a unit. So in some mid-range decks, this card is not really well liked, just because Elysian in particular has a lot of really, really good drops with five power or more. And those are the cards that you most want to Twinning Ritual, but it's also the cards that you already have a lot of copies of. So you're not really in the need or in the market for the same two five drops or the same two six drops. It's more a variety of six drops that helps you out. And since this also adds unreliability in the form of basically a spell that you draw that isn't a unit when you're in top deck mode, that can be really bad for you in some mid-range setups. That being said, the card is pretty strong. The thing that it's really good with is echo cards, specifically Terriax Hatchling and uh, Twin Brood Sauropod. And that kind of synergy is something that you really want to be gunning for in draft, which makes Twinning Ritual an almost like extremely solid pickup. Not only is it a buff to your unit, which is just generally good in draft, but it's also a way to get a copy of a unit that is particularly useful for, to your deck and just basically recreate something cool. That makes it a very solid draft card. In ranked, you want to be careful with it, but it's very solid in particular with Clock Roaches. Uh, if you're playing a Sauropod deck or something that runs cheap flyers like uh, Terriax Hatchling, Twinning Ritual is the card for you. This card works very well with Crown of Possibilities, which we will talk about a little bit more in just a second. Amaran Camel, when you draw a card, you gain one health. Uh, so, mediocre in both draft and ranked, but potentially extremely good, depending on the circumstances. This card has not changed since closed beta, and in closed beta it was one of the most powerful decks for uh, quite a while until people sort of figure out how to deal with it and started to figure out that silence was like a really good thing. So if you're playing like in the early ranks and you're just trying to like get a deck going that's kind of fun control, Amar and Camel's a great common choice to just get a control deck that will live forever. Uh, the amount of health that Amar and Camel games is, uh, gains is simply sick, especially with cards like uh, Crystal and Chalice, but uh, it is unfortunately pretty susceptible to silences, pretty easy to remove, and doesn't generate any pressure, all of which are things that you don't really want in ranked. So as a result, uh, not an amazing ranked card, but still an okay Chalice card, and uh, in draft, basically only if you are playing a slow control deck do you want it. That health gain is really nice, and it does help against aggro decks, but at the same time, you kind of want like one extra health on this thing before it gets really good. Uh, I think it is a potential choice. It, it actually has more power than you would expect it to have. It's not strictly bad, but it's not strictly good either. <laughs> yeah, it does get a silver medal for most decks named after the card. There was camel control for a really long time, and then people started calling it camel less control when the camels went away because they weren't good enough. Crown of Possibilities, units you draw, gain a random skill. There are 15 skills in Eternal at the moment. Um, there are five more incoming, and I'm not sure how many of them will actually be playable. Possible that Warp could come out of Crown, which would be pretty bad. 
Uh, but if there are other options, uh, for the most part, Crown of Possibilities only grants battle skills, which is to say anything that actually affects your unit in some way. It can't give you, like, spell skills of any kind. It can't give you, um, <laughs> like, empower effects or anything very specific. So uh, the skills it can give you are Killer, Charge, Deadly, Quick Draw, Ambush, uh, Flying, Endurance, there's Life Steal, there's a pile of different things that are really, really good to have. Double Damage is an option. Uh, many, many, many things that Crown of Possibilities can do to really buff your card. Similar to Call the Ancients, this is a card that you play out and does not actually give you any advantage or, like, board presence. Uh, unlike Call the Ancients, this card is much more likely to proc and give you some sort of cool effect. If you get a mid-range card with, like, double damage or life steal, that's a pretty good win against a sort of more aggro deck. If you get something with Ambush, then suddenly you have a removal spell in your hand that is also a unit. Uh, that the same reason that Stormlinks is good it makes that good. But the thing where Crown of Possibilities really shines is any deck that can really just sort of abuse the ability to give a skill to a unit. And the most common version of that is Clockroaches. So if you can give a unit Echo, uh, if you have a unit with Echo, then both units get the copy of the skill. And that means that you can draw two Clockroaches with flying, and the Clockroaches will make each other bigger. Use cards like Twinning Ritual and Second Sight to redraw copies of these cards, and then they get more and more skills. And uh, with Twinning Ritual, Second Sight, Excavate, and Nesting Abyssaur all allowing you to redraw cards, that means that Crown of Possibilities can give random skills up to 15, and a unit with 15 skills on it is virtually unstoppable and typically very, very deadly because it'll have things like Quick Draw, Overwhelm, Deadly, Double Damage and Lifesteal, and Killer. So you can just play a unit down, murder something, deal 8 damage to your opponent, heal for 8 life, keep the unit, and it can block next turn. Seems pretty good. Crown of Possibilities has some of the most insane late game potential of any card in the game, and uh, the Clockroach Crown of Possibilities deck is extremely strong for that reason. In draft, uh, this card is a solid B. A very, very good legendary. Uh, it's good to give your units random skills, and it can just save the day in a lot of situations. So as long as you're playing a high creature count, or a high unit count, I would recommend it. False Prince. Uh, Overwhelm 5-5, five, five. when a spell is played directly on False Prince, transform it into a 1-1 one, one frog. Uh, the raid on this card is good enough that he's good in ranked or draft. Um, it's pretty easy to turn False Prince into a 1-1 one, one frog. The thing that makes False Prince good is A, he spirals the game completely out of control if you don't turn him into a 1-1 one, one frog, and B, most of the things that turn him into a 1-1 one, one frog still leave the 1-1 one, one frog alive. So even if your opponent has to throw and levitate, or a levitate's the worst one though, or um, a vanquish is the best one, and you still get the frog, that frog is going to be a problem for your opponent at some point that still has to be dealt with, which means that False Prince is a card that often takes two cards to remove. That makes him pretty effective as an early pressure unit. In addition, he's the only Elysian unit that has five power at three, which is really important for certain types of decks, specifically Dawnwalker and Friendly Wisp decks. Um, False Prince has a lot of potential added value in ranked decks, and that synergy makes him very, very strong. His ability to spiral a draft game out of control extremely quickly means that he's a pretty good pick in draft. He can get removed. Uh, it's not too big a deal if he does. He's such a strong 3-drop that it's typically worth it if you can muster up that triple influence, which is pretty deep and pretty difficult. Make sure you're running Seek Powers if you're running False Prints. Terriax Hatchling. 2-1 Flying Echo. This card is pretty dang good in draft because little flyers are good and card advantage is good, and having a combination of the two is very, very solid. In ranked, it's harder to get Terriax Hatchling working, but... Uh, there are some dinosaur decks that can potentially use it. You have to use cards like Xenon Obelisk or Twinning Ritual to get more hatchlings and also get some value out of them. The main thing about them is that they have such a slow rate that they're pretty susceptible to aggro decks and they're pretty susceptible to like even just big mid-range decks. It takes a while to set up hatchlings in the way that you want to. If you can set up enough though, they're okay in ranked. Uh, but in draft, this card is really, really solid. Uh, it Pairs very well with Second Sight and Twinning Ritual, cards that you want to be drafting anyways. And it is aggressive, it has pressure, it defends you against flyers, it is just a really good card all around in draft. A very, very solid card. 
Abasaur Patriarch, not in draft, so we're only going to talk about it in the context of ranked. Uh, this is a Jex Bounty card, 2-4, flying, your dinosaurs cost 1 less. Ultimate, pay 6 to give your dinosaurs plus 2 plus 2. I love this card, I want this card to have 1 less of an influence cost, because double time, double primal, it turns out is real hard to hit. Um, and I think that's my least favorite thing about Avasaur Patriarch. The stat line's also a little bit unusual. Like, 2-4 is just above torch range, but not actually pressuring. The nice thing about it is that the ultimate does give Avasaur Patriarch plus 2 plus 2, in addition to your dinosaurs, which means that Avasaur Patriarch is a 2-4 that can become a 4-6. That kind of power, even if you have to pay a lot of power for it, is still really strong. Um, and that flexibility is actually something that you kind of want to have. But overall, Dino Tribal isn't a thing yet. Look for this to be a big card in sec set 2 when there are a lot more dinosaurs and there's a lot more dinosaur options. I think Avasaur Patriarch is going to enable some really cool decks. I think there are some kind of fun decks that you can enable right now. Uh, for example, Scourge of Frost Home is a dinosaur. Making Scourge of Frost Home cheaper is always fun. Um, I don't really think that there are that many amazing dinosaurs for Avasaur Patriarch to hit, but it's kind of nice to consider, and uh, it can be a worthwhile card in very specific ranked decks. Overall, not an amazing card, but uh, potential there. Champion of Wisdom, 4-4, four, four, plus 2, plus 2 with flying. This card is really, really good. Uh, the 4-4 four, four, kind of gives it a stealth nerf in some senses, because it is now vulnerable to Vanquish. But since it also is no longer vulnerable to Torch, I think that overall that's a, a pretty big improvement for Champion of Wisdom. Champion of Wisdom can just come down and walk a 3-3, three, three, and that's something that a 4-drop kind of desperately needs to be able to do. So uh, that's pretty solid. As a 6-6 six, six flyer, Champion of Wisdom is the only card that's better on rate than Sandstorm Titan in some circumstances. The Endurance effect can be very strong for Titan, but Champion of Wisdom is a solid, solid uh, alternative in Elysian decks, and it's also the card that you want as the other 4-drop when you're playing an Elysian mid-range deck and you want a lot of 4-drops. Um, the effect's really strong. Uh, it's good enough that you can get it off in both draft and ranked, and that makes this a draft bomb, because big flyers in draft are always solid. Um, it's more likely you're going to get this as a 6-6 six, six than you are going to get it as a flyer, and it's pretty unlikely that you're ever going to have both of them at 4. But you might be able to stress time and get a 6-6 six, six for 4 on 4, and that's a pretty strong effect, so I would say that that's pretty cool. Yeah. New artwork, we'll have to look at that in just a second. Crystalline Chalice, once per turn, you may have to pay two and exhaust, or you may pay two, and exhaust one of your units with two power or less. It gets plus two plus two, and you draw a card. I'm not amazingly fond of this card. Oh, that water is old. This is my new water. <laughs> I'm not amazingly fond of this card, actually. I think it's, uh, it's definitely got some power to it. And uh, there's currently a deck that's running up and down the ladder that's decently strong. Not spectacular, but decently strong. That'll really, really just uh, demonstrate how powerful it is. The thing about Crystal and Chalice is that it's a card that gives you basically an infinite source of draws if your deck is small enough, and also allows your small stuff to finish off your opponent. That means that you have a really, really good control shell out of Crystal and Chalice that you can play with, where you get uh, little dudes down, you play the Crystal and Chalice, and then you exhaust the little dudes to make them bigger. Now you have a bunch of big dudes, and you have a bunch of cards. Uh, the later, the current versions of the Crystal and Chalice deck just use this to get to Channel the Tempest and Great Parliament, and just uh, knock their opponent out with just massive amounts of card advantage and life gain. Crystal and Chalice can hit a surprising amount of really good targets. Lumen Defender is a really good one. Uh, Amber Acolyte and Temple Scribe, both of which are cards that you just want to play in Elysian anyways. Uh, there are a ton of really, really good choices for Crystal and Chalice to hit. Anything with zero power is worth two draws off of, off of Chalice, which means that uh, cards that have zero power suddenly have a lot of value in Chalice decks. There's a lot of strength to this card. In draft, this card is a powerhouse if you can protect it. It is uh, similar to a ranked deck, one of the single most powerful setups that you can get, just in terms of like overall card advantage and overall power. Like getting a Crystal and Chalice setup does mean the end of the game for the opposing drafter. But if you're playing against a tempo deck and you haven't done enough to protect yourself, 
uh, this card's gonna be bad for you. I think, for the most part, this is a complete bomb in draft, but you really have to make sure that the deck is right. Um, I would pretty much always pick it if I see it in draft, though, and try to build the deck around it, so worth considering for that. <coughs> ah, man, throat. Okay. Nesting Avasaur. 3-3, three, three, summon, you may put a card from your hand on top of your deck. Its cost is reduced by 2. You don't usually want to use this to reduce the cost of something big and heavy, but occasionally it does help. Um, in particular, cards like Channel the Tempest, Scourge of Frost Home. Uh, anything with Echo, of course, is really, really good. Uh, but in general, like most of the time, you aren't going to use this to make other things cheaper. Uh, most of the time, this is a pretty good 3-3 with a really useful ability for things like making any card with Echo give you an extra draw, which is even advantage, but really, really worth it for the tempo that you get out of being able to play several uh, Clockroaches for one or to just continually replicate those kinds of cards. Nesting Avasaur has a lot of interesting setup. In draft, this card is always good. You almost never want to use the summon effect in draft, but uh, it is a 3-3 flyer, and that's just good. Uh, so you should play it. It's like a solid B, I say, in draft. And then, uh, of course, it does have those interactions with Echo, which just gives you more Echo cards, which is always solid. So, yeah. This card makes three Echo creatures happen. It's uh, good as a combo card in Carpet Shuffle. Thank you, GCM. Because if you reduce a second site to zero cost that it turns out is really good uh, when you give that card echo later on. Or if you have it and it has echo and you can make it cost zero, then yeah, infinite draws. Nesting Abyssor has a fun combo there. Um, overall, the card's pretty mediocre in ranked. It's uh, one or two of in several decks, and I think it's actually really good as a one or two of. I don't like it as a four of in most decks. Cerso, the Great Glutton. 6-6 six, six, Overwhelm, when a unit blocks or is blocked by Cerso, transform that unit into a 2-2 two, two Pig. All right, let's get this out of the way right away. The most common mistake that a new player will make in Eternal is giving a unit Predator's Instinct or playing a Predatory Carnosaur, anything with Killer, and then being like, I'm going to kill this Cerso with my Predatory Carnosaur. And then the Predatory Carnosaur uses its special attack on Cerso. Cerso is technically blocking it. The Carnosaur turns into a pig. The pig dies. Cerso is still standing. And your life is full of sadness and tears. Don't do that. Uh, Cerso is really, really strong. The thing about this card is that it's really hard to kill by most conventional means. Because it is a hybrid color card, because it has very good stats for its particular cost, because it comes out pretty early and swings pretty hard, and because anything that blocks it is going to transform into a pig. That means that the only way to deal with Cerso outside of hard removal like Death Strike is to block it with three different units and stack them up so that Cerso transforms all three units into pigs and then blocks that way. So it's almost always a three for one. Obviously, you can swing Cerso into an assembly line and that will transform all of the little one ones into two two pigs. So there's another mistake you can make. Thank you again, GCM. Uh, but... The main thing about it is that, like, basically, Cerso represents a significant amount of extra damage and push in most Elysian decks. That makes her an Elysian all-star. Uh, on the flip side, you can give Cerso Killer to neutralize a lot of targets by silencing them as well as killing them and giving you that sweet, sweet overwhelm damage. So Cerso will typically hit anything, turn it into a pig, and then still deal four damage to your opponent's face. That makes her good for pushing damage in a way that's really, really effective. Uh, you can also use fun combat tricks with her. There's not that many in Elysian, but anything that makes her slightly bigger means that you have to use even more units to block Cerso, and that's a big deal. Watch out for cards like Zine and Obelisk with this, because obviously your opponent can block with two units, turn those into three three pigs, and then kill Cerso with them. Or even worse, they can have like two one ones or two three threes off of a fully charged Xenon Obelisk, get two four four pigs, block, only lose one of them, and now have a better unit than they started with. There are, there are ways in which the pigs can bite you. Be a little careful of them. Also, the pig effect does not trigger, uh, or the pig effect turns off Aegis's 
Aegis is, but not, does not transform. So if you are blocked by a Crown Watch Paladin, the Crown Watch Paladin will break the, Aeg the Aegis, but uh, it will not turn into a pig until the next time around. So be aware of that, because cards like Throne Warden can still block Cerso uh, at least as 4-4s, four which still isn't good enough. But uh, yeah, this card's a bomb in draft, obviously. It's really, really solid. You have to get that influence together, but it's worth it because that card is just hard to stop and worth a tremendous amount of value if you can't remove it. Explorer Emeritus. 0-2, exhaust to draw a card. This card's way better in draft now that it is a 0-2 instead of a 0-1. There were a lot of different one damage effects that were very, very good at killing Emeritus in draft, and that made him not as exciting, even though he's a pretty exciting draft card. This card is actually, I think, better than Staff of Stories in draft, which is kind of interesting to consider. Uh, it's just pretty hard to kill him, and uh, that means that if your opponent is not running enough removal, he's not going to draw as many cards. Also, he always gets a card, because you get to exhaust him before your opponent can play any sort of spell. That means that Emeritus is, at the very least, always a cycle at 5, which is eh, never all that good in ranked, but it can be decent. So yeah, I think Emeritus actually probably deserves a little more play in ranked. This card is reasonably strong. It has a, a decent amount of good setup, but obviously it's very vulnerable to silences. Silence tends to be like half of a card effect, which means that your opponent can play down some tempo and also silence Emeritus, or he can be caught up in like a lightning storm or a harsh rule. There are a lot of ways where Emeritus does not actually get what you want out of it. But I think that overall the card's decently strong and ranked, not amazing, and uh, in draft this card is an absolute bomb. Hunting Terriax, 5-3 Flying Ambush. <clears throat> One second. One of the least played mid-range big guys uh, with 5 power and 3 health. That 3 health is pretty meaningful. Being torched is not fun. But there are some reasons why this card is actually, yeah, very underrated. Um, it is really, really good in particular at basically popping down and bringing back a bunch of Dawnwalkers at the end of your turn, or at the end of your opponent's turn, which means that those Dawnwalkers are ready to attack at the beginning of your turn. That means that if you're playing a Dawnwalker heavy deck, you can generate a surprise like 20 damage. That's pretty insane and really, really good if you're playing also cards like Crystallize or anything fun like that. This card eats two drops or eats little two attack units it can eat a surprising amount of like uh, weird things, silenced Lumen Defenders, uh, just random stuff. It can kill cards with Aegis, which is pretty important for things like Champion of Cunning. Uh, it sometimes functions as a removal spell, but typically does not survive after doing so. It works very well with Xen and Obelisk because then it can survive after doing so, and that's something worth doing. And it is almost always a surprise 5 damage, which is a way to close out a game in a situation where your opponent would otherwise be winning. Just watch those torches, be a little bit careful about when you play Terriax, play it smartly, and you can get a lot of mileage out of this card in Elysian midrange. In draft, this card is pretty close to a bomb. Like, big flyers are super important, and that makes it, yeah, just an absolute bomb in that respect. The health is a little bit uh, iffy, and uh, so is the attack, but overall this card is well worth it on rate. I would say it's a solid A. Fortunate Stranger. When a, stranger, when a player plays a stranger, including this one, that player draws a card. Uh, one of the best strangers for draft, obviously, because this card is just really, really good on rate and makes it so all of your other strangers are essentially card-free, which is really, really good if you're just building a bunch of strangers. Getting some of these guys is a very strong way to finish out a stranger curve, but the main thing about it is they don't provide a lot of extra pressure themselves. They're often the first targets, so sometimes they're not amazing. Uh, they don't win a game on their own and that's a little bit tricky, but uh, overall the value generated by them can be really really strong. In ranked, uh, fortunate strangers don't work yet, but I wouldn't say that they won't work eventually. Like. They're kind of interesting, and there is some potential for this card to actually get a little out of control, depending on what the next set of strangers looks like. But uh, as with all strangers, strangers in ranked, just not quite there yet. So we'll see. Curiox the Collector. 
uh, this may be my favorite design in the set. I think I've talked about this. A, I think I've, <laughs> like, it's possible uh, I've gone through a lot of different cards, so it's possible I've already named my favorite, some uh, another card my favorite design in the set, but uh, I have a soft spot for Curiox for sure. Flavorfully, he's wonderful. He's a dragon who traded his eye for knowledge. He is a 6 6 flying endurance. Fate put a dragon's eye into your deck. Uh, he, the Dragon's Eye is zero cost, draw three cards. Fun fact, Curiox is the brother of Nyctatraxian, the dragon from the Clank board game, and also the five color dragon in Eternal. So uh, yeah, Curiox is a pretty sweet dude. There's a lot of cool things going on with him. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, overall, I just love a lot of things about this card. I haven't played enough Curiox decks lately. We have to really like get some going. So um the triple time triple blue is a little bit hard, but not so hard on seven, so that's pretty nice. Uh, the endurance means that the card is actually pretty hard to kill, like it's just, it can't be permafrosted. That's one less thing that it can die to, and being a 6-6 six, six, that's also a hybrid means that it's just pretty decently difficult to deal with. Uh, usually not so difficult to deal with once you're at seven cost, but uh, overall this card has some pretty solid setup. Now, the main thing about it is that overall the stat line's not amazing for a dragon, and the other thing about it is that uh, the dragon's eye is not something you're likely to see. Similar to uh, Call the Ancients, it is a card that does not give you any sort of immediate advantage in its fate effect, but if you ever draw that dragon's eye, that is so, so good for you. And if you expect a game to go long and you're stacking Curioxes in the game, and Dragon's Eye can do some really, really cool things. A free three cards is nothing to scoff at. Drawing a Dragon's Eye will often just win you a control matchup, so Curiox definitely has a place in long-form control decks that really want to win. Um, the thing that is really cool about it, I think, is that Dragon's Eye is actually a strong enough effect that you just want to Celestial Omen for it. So if you're playing a deck slow enough to play Curiox, you're also playing a deck slow enough to be running Celestial Omens. Well, that means that you can pull that uh, Celestial Omen, uh, play, pay six, draw three cards. That's not a bad use of a Celestial Omen. So yeah, there are a lot of ways that you can really make Dragon's Eye happen, and I think that uh, it's pretty well worth it to try it. There are a bunch of fun, cheaty things you can do with the card. The main thing about him, I think, is that he's just really flavorful. He's a really good design. He demonstrates a lot of things that are cool about Eternal, and a lot of cool things about like dragons and like just fun Timmy things, as well as being like a, a really just fun Vorthos card as well. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, that's that's MTG terminology. We'll actually do a, a another video on that in a little bit. It'll probably be one of my first like little vlogs. Okay, but uh, yeah, this card is just amazing and uh, I really like everything about it. I don't think it's amazing in ranked. It's actually pretty pretty weak, like a solid C. In draft, yeah, this card is very, very good. Uh, you do actually have a good chance of drawing Dragon's Eye. A 6-6 six, six Flying Endurance is an absolute bomb. You're not always guaranteed to get to 7, 3, and 3 blue, so you have to be sure to pick up Seek Powers and Amber Acolytes to make it work. But this is a solid enough reason to go Elysian Control, so uh, worth, a, worth a look. And that leads us to the last card, another really fun design, Shimmer Pack. Shimmer Pack is 8, 2 time, 2 primal. Summon, transform any number of units into copies of Shimmer Pack. At 7, this card was too good. And at 8, this card is still pretty bananas. This basically just means that any small token deck can turn suddenly into an immediate and commanding victory, especially with Zine and Obelisk on the field. In particular, the this card has very, very strong interactions with Scouting Party, but the thing that really makes Shimmer Pack shine is its ability to neutralize cards on your opponent's board, including things like Sandstorm Titan, anything with uh, flying that you really don't want to have flying, anything that's just too big, anything that's too small but also is just kind of scary and does some cool effect. Shimmer Pack turns all of those cards into boring vanilla units, and that means that you can really just start to rampage. And if you have Xenon Obelisks on your side of the board, then your Shimmer Packs are bigger than their Shimmer Packs. That's a value. Uh, yeah, this card is a really, really solid finisher. It's on par with Crystallize for finishing a game, and uh, a very, very good way to wind out any sort of token deck. 
even works okay in some mid-range decks. I wouldn't super recommend it, but it can be decent for getting into a getting out of a board stall position. So, uh, in draft, I think this card is actually almost not worth picking. Eh, it's okay. It, it, it does the same things that it says on the tin, but there are going to be situations where you're overwhelmed with units and having a bunch of 4-4s four is actually not as good. Uh, it, it, it often doesn't generate enough of a way to win in draft. I think that it definitely has the ability to just commandingly take control of a game, so it's worth it to pick up if you're already in a lesion, and obviously you're probably going to be picking it up for the dust anyway, so might as well have some fun with it. But uh, this card is like a B-. minus. <coughs> All right, so that's it. <coughs> uh, thanks so much for watching, guys. And uh, I have been Pojo, and <laughs> I'm going to go, like, just die of a cough now. <laughs> See you in a bit. All right, so... <coughs>